uh, uh, religion and philosophy. So um, looking at the intersection between science, technology, and religion. But today I'm going to speak on uh, a topic in ethics. Uh, as um, uh, uh, you uh, mentioned in philosophy. philosophy. So, um, so um, looking, looking at the intersection in science, science, technology, technology and religion. 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 But, today, but today, I'm going, I'm going to speak, speak on, on uh, a topic in ethics, ethics. Uh, as, as um, um, a, 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 a religion, religion, religion and philosophy. philosophy. So, so um, looking, looking at the intersection in science, 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 technology and religion. 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 But today, but today, I'm going to speak, speak on, on uh, a topic in ethics. Just one second. That um, they want me to do is to look at ethical theories from around the world and see how we can learn from one another, how we can uh, uh, do comparative ethics, cross cultural ethics, um, look at ideas of Eastern ethics. Uh, ethical ideas coming from India, from South Asia. And I think that's something that uh, has not been done. Uh, something that's very important is to look at our ethical uh, heritage, uh, look at uh, ethical dilemmas in, in the uh, Hindu traditions. And, um, and uh, this is something that the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies and um, the, the, the academic intellectual circle that surrounds it um, is now doing. And I, there's now various scholars working on this. Uh, it's such important work because as we know, it's been greatly developed in Western philosophy, but perhaps not so much in contemporary uh, Indian philosophy. It's definitely there, but we haven't mined it we haven't discussed it in the modern discourse, in the contemporary discourse. So in my presentation, I will start by looking at some discussions in Western philosophy and sort of the modern Western discourse, uh, and then move on to um, the Bhagavad Purana, and even before the Bhagavad Purana, look at the Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita. So, I chose this topic because I think that it's a very important topic, uh, one that is very close to our heart. Uh, we all grow up in families and communities and nations. And that's actually one of the reasons why we're here, right? Um, we all feel connected uh, in a sense of loyalty because we happen to be coming from a common heritage. Um, so what do we owe one another? Um, how, how loyal do we need to be to one another? And this is what we're going to discuss today. So um, uh, I thought I'll start with a very classic problem of ethics. Uh, it's called the runaway trolley. And this problem is essentially this uh, little story, so to say, is that there's a man uh, driving a trolley down the tracks and at a certain point, he realizes that he's lost control of his trolley. And as he looks down the tracks, he sees that um, there are five people working on the tracks ahead of him. And if, uh, if uh, uh, he continues forward, these five people will die as a result of the impact from the trolley. However, if he takes a turn, you know, there's a cutoff from the trolley, uh, then only one or two people will die. Um, there's less people if he takes the turn. And so the problem in ethics asks this question, this uh, sort of, uh, this situation raises the ethical question that should the trolley car driver uh, change directions and kill the two people instead of the five people directly in front of them? What would you all say? I think most of you would think, well, this is a no-brainer. This is very easy. Um, certainly, you should uh, take the cutoff and kill two people instead of five. And why would you say that? Because killing two people only is better than killing five. So I think all of us would agree that, um, that certainly 
uh, saving the most number of lives um, is beneficial than, uh, than uh, killing the most number of lives in such a situation. Well, very good. Um, so this makes sense to us. And most people would say uh, this is you know, a utilitarian or consequentialist position. The most amount of happiness for the most number of people makes sense. But now imagine a slightly different situation. And in this situation, the one person on the right side of the tracks that you are prepared to kill to save the five people in front of you, that one person is your dear friend or a family member. Now in this situation, what would you do? Would you proceed forward and um, bulldoze through the five people in front of you? Or would you turn right and kill the one person who is your friend? Would you turn right and kill your friend or bulldoze through the five people? Would anyone like to share uh, their thoughts or their response? I don't know if, if these are in, meant to be interactive or not, and if I can do this. But uh, uh, just curious, um, which, which path would we take in that case? All of a sudden, this simple ethical problem called the, the runaway trolley problem is no longer so simple anymore. And we, I personally, I'm having difficulty making this decision. Uh, what would you all think? Anyone? We'll just take maybe one or two responses. Can I say, I suppose um, uh, you'd start exactly in the same manner of saying that, well, you don't want to compromise the one, uh, the five people, um, and it depends on your relationship with the first one. But then you might actually say, well, I might actually not figure out how to stop, stop the trolley or something and then direct it towards the one person. <laughs> that mm. seems to be the logical approach. Yes, well, uh, the best case scenario would be that you would, could just stop the trolley and everyone's life would be saved. But this ethical dilemma is asking, well, given that that is not an option, the brakes have failed, it has to go in one direction or the other, then would you choose your friend, one person, over the five, or would you choose the five? And this is really an unsolvable problem. Right, as you mentioned, Nitinji, uh, it depends on your relationship. And if that relationship is very close, imagine if it's your son or your father or your or your daughter or your wife or husband. Perhaps you might still save their life, even though you are sacrificing the life of five people. And the question is, the real question is, would anyone blame you, or would that seem very natural? Would that seem very human to do? And I think uh, 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 this is the question of loyalty. This is the question of, of, of uh, this is at the heart of this issue. So um, liberalism says that we don't owe anything to anyone. <laughs> the image of this, uh, uh, the questions of loyalty and the questions of owing things to one another depends on our image of ourself. It, it depends on the image of self. And liberalism sees the image of self as free and independent. We are not intrinsically connected with anyone else. It offers a powerful, liberating vision. So while this vision clearly, in, especially in light of the example that I just gave you, uh, has drawbacks, it also has a positive side that it offers a powerful liberating vision of a free and independent person that doesn't owe things to their, their ancestors or their predecessors or their friends or their relatives. As free moral persons, we're not bound by any ties of history or of tradition or of inherited status that we haven't chosen for ourselves. And this final phrase is important, that we haven't chosen for ourselves. We aren't bound by any of these ties of history or nationality or country. And so we're unbound by any moral ties 
prior to our choosing them. So a liberalist response, a liberalist thinking, is such an individual is expressed by those contemporary Americans, for example, where I am at currently, who deny any responsibility for the effects of slavery upon black Americans, <clears throat> saying, I never owned any slaves, right? So, I mean, my ancestors, they made those mistakes um, and they are obliged to, to apologize, to try to uh, rectify their, their atrocities towards the slaves. But even though I am American, I have no responsibility for the effects of slavery on black Americans simply because I never owned any slaves. There's no meaning of loyalty there because myself is independent from my community, from my nation, and from my history. Or the young German who believes that having been born after 1945 means that what Nazis did to Jews have no, has no moral relevance to his relationship to his Jewish contemporaries. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> in a similar manner, right? Um, uh, some Germans feel very obliged and the country as a whole has apologized to the Jews for the atrocities that happened during the Holocaust. But other young Germans feel that they have no obligation or relevance to that because they were born after 1945 and therefore there were no um, atrocities done since that time and they have no obligation. So this is the position of liberalism. <clears throat> Uh, the other, uh, the, the position sort of in response to that is communitarianism. The communitarian critics of Kantian and Rawlsian liberalism, uh, and Immanuel Kant was, uh, was someone who championed the position of liberalism, acknowledge that there is something powerful <clears throat> and inspiring in this account of the free, independent choosing self. I think individualism is, you know, one of the hallmarks of Western society, and, and it has also liberated many people. But they argue it misses something. It misses a whole dimension of moral life, and even political life. And these include obligations of membership, loyalty, solidarity, and other moral ties that may claim us for reasons that can't trace to an act of consent. So the communitarian says, that's okay, that's good, but it misses something, something that we, regardless of what we believe in, regardless of what philosophical position we take, something that we do in our day-to-day -day lives, every single day, every single hour, in fact, in terms of our relationship with our families, our communities, our countries. So while a very idealistic, very wonderful, very uh, nice philosophy, liberalism misses something very key, very deep about human nature. <clears throat> um, this philosopher McIntyre uh, gives an account of what he calls a narrative conception of the self. Human beings are essentially storytelling creatures. And it's this narrative conception of the self that we find throughout the Vedas, the Puranas, um, something that I will get into very soon in our discussion and the epics, the Mahabharata. So he talks about the narrative conception of the self, that human beings are essentially storytelling creatures. That means I can only answer the question, what am I to do? if I can answer the prior question of what story or stories do I find myself a part of? So he believes, being a communitarian, he believes that we cannot answer the question of what I am supposed to do. What do I owe to others? If I cannot answer, if I don't answer the prior question of which story am I part of? Why? Because this story is part of me. This is what I am made of. 
I am someone's son or daughter, <clears throat> a citizen of this or that city. I belong to this clan, that tribe, this nation. Hence, what is good for me has to be the good for someone who inhabits these roles. So what is good for me as a person has to be good for a son, for a father, for a, a teacher, uh, for a citizen. I inherit from the past of my family, my city, my tribe, my nation, a variety of debts, inheritance, inheritances, expectations, and obligations. Now, why is this? I mean, what, uh, why does this make sense? Well, someone might say, like the young German or the young Americans, that I don't owe any, any debt to, to, to the blacks or the uh, Jews because I'm not, uh, I, I don't have any debt towards them because I never did anything wrong to them. It was my nation that did that. It was my ancestors that did that. However, that same person might be accepting an inheritance, right? They might be part of the Ford family and they're accepting a very long and large inheritance of their family tradition, of their family business, which greatly benefits them. It privileges them in their present life. <clears throat> and so if they're not willing to accept their debts, so to say, the, the debts of their ancestors, of their predecessors, then are they also unwilling to accept their, the inheritances, the benefits that they've received from their country and from their um, the tradition? Certainly they are accepting those things, the things that benefit them, that were due to their, due to their parents and their forefathers and, and before them. So why not their debts? Why not also carry uh, the burden of what they owed or do owe now to the rest of society? So very interesting question, right? We are very enthusiastic to keep our inheritances. So why not the expectations and the obligations that come from being in that community, in that family, in that tradition? So um, here are some examples some very powerful examples uh, that the communitarian gives. <clears throat> uh, think about relationships between parents and children, a relationship that is deeply discussed, greatly prized in South Asian traditions, especially. So the relationship between parents and children, I'm a parent now, I have two children, a son and a daughter. Um, so, <clears throat> Uh, men, most of us on this call may have children, so we can clearly imagine this situation. Suppose there are two children drowning. You saw that they were drowning, and one was yours. McIntyre asks, do you have the obligation to first flip a coin before you go and save your child first? Imagine a situation that two children are drowning, and you can only save one. They're in different directions, and if you save one, you won't get to the other one in time. He asks, do you have an obligation to flip a coin at that point? Say, someone give me a coin. I'm going to flip this to figure out which child am I going to save first? Because ethically or morally, I am not uh, justified to first ch save my own child before the, someone else's child. Of course, we would say no. No one would blame you if you ran over and first saved your own child. So we do have a feeling of loyalty or obligation in that direction more than saving, in saving our own children than saving any other child. Now, in this case, you might say, well, we chose to have our own children, and therefore we, that's why we have the responsibility to save them first, not simply because of the fact that they are our children. It's because of sort of a social contract that we accepted when we had children. We made a, um, a sort of a unwritten contract with our child that we're going to protect them in a way that we did not with another child. And that's why we have an obligation to save the child. One could make that point, but then 
even if we accept that point, think about the situation the other way around. That is the children's obligation to their parents. Certainly no children accept a social contract to have their own parents, right? While we choose to have our children, our children don't choose to have us as parents. So think about this example now, consider two aging parents, one yours and one another's. Are you obliged again to flip a coin if it's a choice between saving your own mother and saving another person's mother? <clears throat> Probably not. <clears throat> so there is something uh, that we accept as loyalty that comes from simply our membership in a certain family or community. <clears throat> and <clears throat> this, uh, this communitarian principle uh, reminds me of, a, of an incident in the Mahabharata, which is very, um, which when I first read, was very almost disturbing to me, or, or you could say intellectually, um, uh, it shook me up. Yeah, not disturbing. It just shook me up intellectually that we tend to think that, you know, the Pandavas are, are the virtuous ones, which they certainly are by their character uh, and the way that they, you know, carry themselves and the tolerance and compassion and kindness that they deal with, uh, with others. And we think that Duryodhana is uh, the villain. But as a young man, Duryodhana feels that he's been wronged because his father is the king. The reality is, is that presently, Dhritarashtra is the king. And Duryodhana is the eldest child of the king. So while we think of Duryodhana as a villain, Duryodhana raises the issue that He's the eldest child of the present king. So why is the kingdom not rightfully his? The Pandavas are supposedly fighting for the kingdom, Yudhishthira and Arjuna. I think most of you here know the basic story of the Mahabharata, um, have a basic idea, at least of, of the basic plot. And so they're fighting for the kingdom because they feel it is rightfully theirs. Their father, Bandhu, was the king and Yudhishthira is the eldest son of Pandu and um, and so they are they are supposed to be the rightful heirs of the king the kingdom but the Yodhan is raising the issue that right now my father whatever it is Pandu died my father is the king and I'm the eldest one so why should I not get the kingdom even on a dharma point of view the point of view that the Pandavas are coming with and that Vidura and Bhishma and all are saying that on the basis of Dharma, Yudhishthira should, should get it. <clears throat> well, um, Vidura responds that, um, well, your father is not really the king. He was more just taking the place of a king until we have one. Pandu was the king, but because your father is blind, and the codes of dharma say that the king cannot be blind. Your father is not the king, really. He's just taking the place. He's kind of an interim king. He's taking the place of a king until the replacement king is found. And because Yudhishthira is the eldest son of the king, who is Pandu, who has now died, therefore the kingdom goes to Yudhishthira, not to you, Duryodhana. But then Duryodhana raises another question. He says to Vidra, he says, but why should I suffer for the fact that my father is blind? My father is blind. And that's why, you know, he's blind. But I'm not blind. My father is the eldest in the family. And therefore, you know, he, uh, he, it is his rightful kingdom. Now he happens to be blind. That's, that's his physical impairment, so to say, that's not allowing him to be the king. But that's not my fault. I'm still this eldest son of, of, of Dhritarashtra, who should have been the king. And it's, this, it's at this point that Vidra then, then uh, tells the Yodhana something um, that shook me up and said that, no, the son cannot 
the son cannot demand things that the father does not have. The, the, the son uh, ha is, is liable, so to say, to in, in, uh, inherit the father's uh, fortune and also misfortune. So your, uh, your, your claim that, well, my father is blind, but why should I suffer because of that? Or why should I be denied the kingdom because of that reason? is not a valid claim because Vidura is talking in terms of a communitarian. He's saying, <clears throat> certainly this discussion is even relevant simply because you are Dhritarashtra's son, right? Uh, you are Duryodhana because you are Dhritarashtra's son. And that's why you even are considering the possibility that you could be king. Now, if you are taking upon your father's fortunes, then you also have to inherit his misfortune, which is the fact that he's blind and the implications that come from the fact that he's blind and therefore he's not the king and therefore you're not the eldest son of the king. Yudhishthira is the eldest son of, of the king. And here we see that in fact, there is a tension in dharma, right? There's a, there's a, a, a dilemma, a, a question that's been raised because on one hand, um, Vidura has a very good point on the other hand, Duryodhana also has a good point because how much is Duryodhana required to partake in his father's misfortune? And does he have a point, right? So the Mahabharata's narrative conception of the self sees the self as claimed or encumbered, at least to some extent, by the history, the tradition, and the communities of which it's a part. <laughs> but this may repel some of us because it may say our obligations of membership, just collective selfishness, a form of prejudice, right? Sometimes we do feel encumbered by these traditions, uh, by these obligations. And at certain points that this obligations of membership can become prejudice. It can turn around and it can actually become a way of, of oppressing others because we are part of a membership that is privileged we may um, oppress others. <clears throat> Furthermore, another even larger question is what happens when communitarian obligations or ob obligations to our community are in conflict? Why? Because we have many communities. We have our families and our obligations to our families. We're, we have obligations to our nation, to our society, to so many different people. And our obligation to our family may be in conflict with our obligation to our community. Which, um, which is also a very interesting point. So here's an example of this, <clears throat> um, a very contemporary, very uh, modern example. Uh, in America, there is a man by the name of uh, Billy Bulger, uh, very famous. Uh, uh, he is the president, uh, he was the president of the state senate of Massachusetts. And then he became the president of the University of Massachusetts, a very successful, powerful politician. And his brother, uh, sorry, Whitey Bulger, uh, he um, became one of the most wanted figures uh, on the, on, by the FBI. He was a criminal, a, 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 he had murdered many people. And when Billy was asked by the FBI to give information about his brother, then Billy said, I, I am not obliged to help put my brother in trouble. And therefore he decided not to share information about his brother, even though it appears that he had some knowledge about his whereabouts. So this is a situation where he is expressing his loyalty to his brother by not giving information by which he would get caught. But at the same time, he is uh, not uh, fulfilling his obligation to his community or his nation, and especially those who are murdered by Whitey, uh, by telling information or giving information about his brother who could cause harm, continue to cause harm to others. Another example on a more national scale is the example of Robert Lee, who was um, uh, given the 
was offered the position to become the, the captain of the Union Army by Abraham Lincoln. And Robert Lee, uh, when he is given that position, realizes that this means um, war against Virginia, his home country, his own his home state. And, uh, and when he realizes that, although he fully supported the purpose of the Union, the goal of the Union, he pulls back and he says that he will not accept that position. With all my devotion to the Union, I have not been able to make up my mind to raise my hand against my relatives, my children, my home, the state of Virginia. The Union is dissolved. I shall return to my native state and share the miseries of my people. Save in her defense, I will draw my sword no more. Now, in this case, his loyalty is actually, uh, his loyalty to his family and his uh, state is actually uh, supporting slavery, a cause that none of us could support. Right? Yet he is choosing to fight on the wrong side because, because of his loyalty to his family and his people. And finally, just one more example before we uh, get into the Mahabharat and uh, Bhagavata Purana. During World War II, French resistant pilots flew bombing raids over occupied France. One day, one of the pilots received his target and noticed that the village he was being asked to bomb was his home village. He refused, not disputing that it was, at, that it was as necessary as the target he bombed yes, yesterday. He refused on the ground that it would be a special moral crime for him to bomb his people, even in a cause that he supported, the cause of liberating France. Yeah. So certainly all of us would greatly respect this pilot's sentiment. In fact, we would even honor it, that although he's fighting in the battle, he's unwilling to do the actual task of bombing his village even though he accepts or, or, or sees the need of doing it. He accepts the cause being part of that, um, part of that army. So these uh, examples, um, they actually uh, remind us, they, they sort of bring back uh, memories of key incidences in the Mahabharat. And if we, think back to the Bhagavad Gita, right? We can not help but think that this is very much Arjuna's situation. Arjuna is fighting a just battle. He knows that this battle is necessary because the other side is very vicious, very cruel. Uh, Duryodhana tried to kill them in so many ways. Uh, he was overall a very cruel person. He would be, you know, killing people left and right. He tried to um, uh, molest their wife, Draupadi, uh, disrobe them in an assembly. Yet when he arrives there on the battlefield, when he reaches there uh, and he's, he's present uh, there, he tells Krishna, he says, on the other side, I see my friends, I see my relatives, I see my superiors, and therefore I don't want to fight. I simply just don't want to fight because such, such a battle will not bring me any happiness. It will not bring me any good fortune. It won't bring me any fame. What, what pleasure can I derive from killing my own kinsmen, from killing the people who I would one day hope to enjoy this kingdom with? What pleasure would I derive from killing my teachers and grandsire who are worthy of my worship? And so Arjuna is expressing a sentiment very similar to the French pilot. He's expressing a sentiment of loyalty. That although he understands that this war is necessary and is certainly just, this is why they came to that battle. His, um, his feelings of loyalty take precedence in this situation. His obligations of loyalty take precedence and therefore he wishes not to fight. 
And in that very situation, right, uh, Krishna tells, uh, actually, first of all, um, appreciates his, his kind-heartedness. Because most warriors, especially of the degree, who have the degree of power of Arjuna, would not think in a compassionate way. I mean, one of the rules in sort of the kings of, of, of Europe was the first thing they did was kill all their family members, right? Um, to be sure that their reign on uh, reign uh, was unimpeded by any competitors. But here Arjuna is expressing an opposite emotion, one of uh, great loyalty, a feeling of obligation towards those who help them, what to speak of killing them, but, but an obligation towards them that, that, you know, I should not fight with them and let them have the kingdom. Let them kill me. That's okay. Uh, so Krishna appreciates that feeling, that soft-heartedness that Arjuna expresses. And in fact, commentators on the Gita, they write that this is actually one of the reasons why Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna. It's because, and not to someone else, but to Arjuna, because he was so soft-hearted, because he was so kind, and that made him a proper recipient of the Bhagavad Gita. But then what does Krishna do? Krishna reminds Arjuna that he has also other loyalties. He has loyalties towards the citizens to provide them justice. He has a loyalty towards Draupadi to give her justice for the harms that are, have been you know, done to her. He has a loyalty towards, um, uh, towards uh, dharma itself, to righteousness itself, to do the right thing. He has a loyalty towards dharma. And finally, one of the messages of the Gita is that he has a loyalty also towards Krishna who is God. He has a loyalty towards uh, pleasing Krishna uh, uh, in, the, in the Gita. The role Krishna has is certainly one of Bhagavan, or it says Sri Bhagavan of uh, He has a loyalty towards Krishna, towards God, toward, towards doing the right thing. So in the course of all of these loyalties, he's telling Arjuna, you have competing loyalties here. You have, Arjuna realizes he has competing loyalties. And this is why when the, when the um, Gita begins, Arjuna is so perplexed because he also, being very learned himself, he knows that. And that's why he can't figure out which route to take. If he's loyal to his nation, to his wife, to, to his own self and to God, then he has to fight. But if he's loyal to his brothers and, and superiors and his teachers, then he should not fight. Um, uh, and uh, sorry, I skipped a few slides just in the interest of time. This took a bit longer. So um, there's different viewpoints on ethics. Uh, there's different, you know, um, theories of ethics. There's ethical principles that are based on universal moral principles called deontological ethics. There's ethical principles that are based on the consequence of an action, which is called consequentialist ethics. There are virtue ethics or, or ethics based upon who we are. Uh, you know, uh, um, ethical principles based upon different people and the different roles that they have in society. And there's divine, there's divine command ethics or ethics based upon religious teachings or divine commands. And there's also love ethics or ethics based upon principles of love. And I believe that the principles of loyalty are based upon love ethics. They're based upon, they can't be figured out or understood by any of these other frameworks, but they have to be figured out based upon the principle of love. And this is why when I started with the trolley problem, right, someone mentioned, uh, Nitin, you, uh, you, made, you really hit the nail on the head when you said, well, it really depends on the relationship you have with that one person or those two people on the other track. It will that relationship will depend, will, will make the decision as to whether or not you'll be able to turn the steering wheel or not. And that's called love ethics. And one of the messages of the Gita and particularly the Bhagavata Purana is this love ethics where 
beyond dharma, which is clearly in conflict here for Arjuna, there's many different dharmas that are coming in conflict. There is the principle of, principle of bhakti, which is love. And Krishna is telling Arjuna that, well, on one level, do it because it's your duty. But since you have many duties, you can't figure out what is your duty, then rise even beyond that and do it out of your uh, loyalty. Where, where is your heart? Uh, what is, where is your bhakti? Where is your love? What is the principle of love here? Uh, and that is um, uh, actually, uh, you could say, the, from what I could research and what I could find, that is the Sanskrit word for loyalty. It is bhakti. If you look at Monier Williams Dictionary and you go to the English Sanskrit Dictionary uh, and you put in loyalty, the words that, that Monier Williams gives is bhakti. Raja bhakti, which is sort of bhakti towards the king, loyalty, a feeling of loyalty towards the king. Prabhu bhakti, or bhakti or loyalty towards a master. Swami bhakti, a similar word. Uh, Drida bhakti, resolute devotion or the resolute love. But it is actually bhakti or love, the love ethic that makes us, that drives us to make most of our decisions. And, um, and while Arjuna is thinking about his own friends and relatives, he's feeling loyal towards them because they're his friends and relatives. Krishna's saying, well, move from your own sort of self-centeredness and as a king, as a warrior, you have to think about a larger circle, which is your love towards the citizens, towards dharma, and ultimately towards me, uh, Krishna. And that loyalty should take precedence, your, your devotion or your love towards, your, um, towards the citizens. Um, and so, the Bhagavata Purana actually really brings this idea of um, parodharma in relation to svadharma in deep, in, in clear focus. This idea of, of the love ethic. Uh, the Bhagavata Purana greatly gives a narrative conception of self. It talks about the self, recognizing that the self is inherently connected with its environment. So it, is, it does give a uh, um, it doesn't see the self as, as isolated, as, you know, separated from its environment. It also recognizes that there's competing views of dharma. So the self has many different dharmas, many different loyalties towards family, community, and society. And it therefore recognizes that there's a tension between our, our dharmas towards our different communities, and also our parodharma, or our dharma, towards God, towards the supreme, uh, to our supreme dharma, which is also called sanatana dharma. And one narrative in particular, two narratives in particular, I think, greatly uh, illustrate this point or bring it into focus. And it shows how um, the Bhagavata Purana was thinking very broadly, it was thinking beyond uh, the, the loyalties related to caste, related to um, tribe or country or nation. And this particular uh, narrative, I particularly like it because, um, you know, we live in a world of, in which um, equality, racism, uh, casteism is a big discussion. And the Bhagavata Purana, although it's written um, you know, even academic circles say, you know, uh, uh, third or fourth century AD, so over 1500 years ago. At that time, the Bhagavata Purana is recognizing a dharma that transcends our loyalties, uh, or you could say, um, our, a dharma that um, not just transcends, but also um, uh, is more important. It, it, uh, more important than our day-to-day -day dharmas. So in this narrative, uh, Krishna is in the forest with his friends, 
and they're enjoying their time there. They're having a great, you know, uh, time playing with their friends and and herding the cows. And after some time, they feel hungry. And these boys, you know, they're just village boys. They're looking for food. And like young boys, when they feel hungry, they really feel hungry. I have a daughter and a son, and I and I I know that uh, the small one, he's a, a year and a half, and um, and so. Krishna tells these boys that go nearby to these to a community of brahmanas who are performing sacrifices there. And when you visit them, then ask them for some food and tell them that Krishna is asking that we're, we're you know, playing with Krishna and we're asking for some food and see what they respond. So these boys, they go to the brahmanas and they ask for food. And sure enough, the brahmanas immediately tell them to get away, go far away because they were brahmanas and the boys were from Vaishya communities or lower communities. And, um, and they did not want to be disturbed. Well, um, uh, when this happens, then uh, the boys come back to Krishna and they explain how they were turned back and not given any food. At that point, Krishna then tells the boys, now go to the wives of the brahmanas and talk to them, speak to them, and tell them your quandary, your, your difficult situation that we need food, and see how they respond. So they go to the wives of the brahmanas, and they ask them for food. And when they do, then the Bra wives, they immediately respond with their, with their full hearts. And not only do they agree to give them food, but they bring the food to Krishna and their friends. Although, again, they belong to a higher caste, um, Krishna and the coward boys are of a Vaishya caste, but they do so because they have understood an apparently more deeper point than their husbands have. So the Bhagavata Purana describes this as follows. It says, taking along a great variety of the four types of food in pots, they surge forth to meet their beloved like rivers to an ocean. Although they were obstructed by their husbands, brothers, relatives, and sons, their hopes of meeting Krishna had long been sustained by hearing about Krishna's extraordinary activities and qualities. So they don't think about uh, their loyalties to their caste, to their husbands, um, even though others were dissuading them. They thought about their loyalty to Krishna because they had this relationship of love towards him, their loyalty uh, 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 towards humanity, so to say, and towards God transcended their loyalties to their specific communities. And so here's another image. They bring the food and offer it to Krishna with great devotion. And after they do this, their husbands, the Brahmanas, come home. And when they come home, they recognize that they had actually made a mistake and how their wives had actually acted on a higher level. They had transcended the bonds, the boundaries of Svadharma and acted on the level of Parodharma. And this is what the Brahmanas say. And I'll end with this so that then we can have more discussion. It's the final quote, a very beautiful quote. So I'll read this for you. They say, curses on that birth, which is threefold. Curses on the vows. Curses on extensive learning. Curses on our family lineage. Curses on skill in rituals. We still remain averse to Adhokshaja Krishna. Truly the Maya of Bhagavan bewilders even yogis. Because of it, we Brahmanas, the gurus of humanity, are confused about our own self-interest. Aho, see the unlimited devotion of these very women for Krishna, the guru of the world. Their devotion has pierced the fetters of death under the guise of household life. Neither the, the samskara of purificatory rites of the twice born, nor residence in the house of the guru, nor austerity, nor inquiry into the self, nor rites of cleanliness, nor auspicious rituals were practiced by these women. Nonetheless, they were constant in devotion to Krishna, the Lord of the Lords of Yoga, whose glories are renowned. This was not the case with us, even though we have undergone the samskara and other such rites. 
Oh, how fortunate we are to have wives such as these. Their devoutness has given rise to unwavering devotion to Hari in us. So, um, in these examples, what we've seen is that we've seen the importance of loyalty. We've seen the importance of dharma. But at the same time, we've seen that how at a certain point, uh, that those loyalties uh, change, those loyalties um, expand or they are applied in different situations. Um, and one of the things that uh, the, the, the wives of the Brahmanas, they tell uh, Krishna is that, uh, because when they meet them, I've sort of summarized this, they, they tell, them, tell them that, you know, um, Krishna t- tells them that, that, why have you come to give us this food? Your husbands will be very angry with you. And according to the codes of dharma, this is not right because your husbands uh, should be happy with what you're doing and you should, you know, uh, you know, this, this standard um, uh, 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 social roles that you find in that culture. And so you have a dharma towards your family members and you're sort of defying them when you are coming here. And the Brahmana's wives, they say, but uh, you are actually the soul within all. So actually our dharma is first towards you. Um, And so we are actually not breaking dharma, but we're actually expanding our definition of dharma. We're now, we are fulfilling our dharma both towards our husbands and also you because you are actually the soul in all living beings. A very subtle point, a kind of a, a very deep point there. So uh, the principles of, of loyalty uh, do exist. So yeah, so this, this is essentially um, the, 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 the uh, uh, one of the messages of this story is that the principles of lo- the Bhagavata recognizes that principles of loyalty must exist. Um, it sort of does not ascribe to a, a liberal point of view that loyalty does not exist or, or, or we don't have any responsibilities to our communities and our nations. But these loyalties need to be taken in relation or um, in, in um, there, there has to be a recognition that there's a tension between Svadharma and Parodharma. These loyalties have to be taken uh, with the understanding that there are competing views of dharma, and then we have to decide well, which loyalty is most important to us, which loyalty uh, takes precedence over other forms of loyalty. So I've spoken a lot here. I'll stop at this point and see if there's any uh, comments, questions, reflections on these different thoughts, um, because I think this will be the most interesting part. So. Thank, thank you very much, Gopal. Uh, just as you were wrapping up, we've had a couple of questions all, already. Uh, one, one of them touches on uh, just how you were finishing off. It's from Yogesh. Uh, and his question is, what about casteism? Does society owe anything? Which, if you wouldn't mind elaborating on your just your finishing lines. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, does caste owe anything? Does society owe anything? Yes. Yes. Uh, so perhaps I could get a little clarification here. Um, does does society owe anything to uh, to who? To the, to the occurrence of casteism. I see. Okay. Um, well, uh, it it definitely does. I mean, this is this is. Um, um, well, society, society, and I guess I, this is where I'm having a little difficulty understanding the question because societies are made up of individuals, right? And in certain uh, in societies, there are certain individuals who are more privileged, who are of the higher castes, and those who are of lower castes. So certainly, uh, once caste is abolished, uh, abolished, then those of the higher castes do owe to the lower caste. Members of, of that part of society do owe, do have uh, loyalties 
do have, uh, they, they owe um, the, the uh, improving, or you could say um, helping the other, other sections of society. So certainly I would say that yes, um, various sections of society, um, because they're inheriting uh, benefits and also um, obligations to other sections of society, they owe one another um, uh, uh, these, uh, these, uh, you know, these principles of kindness, compassion, um, ca caring for, for others who are less privileged. Um, and this is precisely the communitarian argument that, that, or the ethics of love, that beyond our things that, that we volunteer for, so we certainly are, we owe things to others that we volunteer for, but there's certain things that we may not even volunteer for, but we owe them simply because we are part of a community and we have a responsibility um, towards others. Thank you. There is a question from uh, Nitin. Um, mm. Ethics vary uh, amongst communities. Mm. What are meta-ethics? Mm. So ethics vary amongst communities. What are me meta-ethics? This is actually a very, um, very interesting point because uh, one of the things I, I like to look at is sort of comparative ethics or cross-cultural ethics. And, um, and if we look at uh, ethics very uh, deeply, right, we find that there are principles of uh, the golden rule, so to say, um, uh, beneficence, uh, non-maleficence, uh, freedom, welfare, that are common to all ethical uh, frameworks. And these principles, they, you know, are sort of universal principles of ethics that are applied in different situations that take different, that manifest in different forms. And one of the beauties, so to say, of this idea of dharma is that one of the first things that the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Bhagavata recognize is that in all situations, we do have competing views of dharma. In other words, or, or we will have tensions in dharma, that if you're, you're going to be kind to someone, then it may involve not being kind to someone else. And this is what life is about, that you have to figure out. Uh, this is why the Mahabharata is such an interesting narrative, because Arjuna has to fight with his uh, friends and relatives in order to, um, in order to uh, 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 do the right thing towards his country, towards, towards his nation, towards dharma, his duty. And so these principles of dharma will be inherently in conflict. So while dharma itself, the principle of doing good is universal, dharma itself is universal, how dharma is applied is uh, relative. It is based upon principles of utilitarianism, consequentialism. And we find, for example, in the Mahabharata that Krishna is, is um, teaching an ethics of love uh, he at times tells Arjuna to uh, break his principles of dharma. He tells Yudhishthira to, to make a lie, to do the right thing, because uh, he says there's higher principles than simply the principles of morality. You must fight this war. Now you've come so far uh, for the benefit of humanity, even if you have to break some moral principles. Um, and so Krishna's viewpoint of dharma is not so straightforward. He's not saying like the sort of the Kantian uh, deontological ethics that we talked about, that all principles are universal in all situations. He's, he's recognizing that there, these principles do go in conflict. So uh, there is a meta ethic there. And that meta ethic is intrinsically related with how that ethics is applied. Uh, the sort of the practical ethics, how it's applied in different situations. Thank you. We have a question from Pasha. Um, I think he's in Malaysia. Mm. Um, 
what is your view on liberalism and spirituality? For example, why should I do my offerings to ancestors, mm. serve my nation, etc., mm. when all mm. these things are material and impermanent? Mm. I should only be concerned with God, mm. uh, the permanent one, and not give second thought to superficial obligations in society like country and family. Mm. <laughs> Wonderful question. Uh, thank you. And your question actually helps me also clarify my own thoughts. Uh, um, this is precisely why I, I sort of ended uh, with the example of the Brahmanas and their wives and the uh, sort of their, they're breaking their, their loyalty towards their husbands in favor of their loyalty towards God, who is Krishna. In, in, in this particular narrative, right? The Bhagavad Purana. In the Bhagavad Purana, Krishna is uh, considered to be God. So in, in this situation, their reasoning is very much what you are describing. <clears throat> that um, uh, their loyalty towards God comes first before their loyalties toward, towards dharma. But the key thing to recognize here is that in either case, they don't give up, so to say, the path of loyalty. They don't give up the path of bhakti. They have either devotion towards their family, towards their society, their dharma, or devotion towards God. So, so in the favor of performing their higher loyalty, their higher dharma, they can give up their lower dharma, so to say, their svadharma. But they but they're not justified in giving up a svadharma or their community dharma unless they accept a paradharma or a higher dharma. A very key point here. So there's, there's sort of no room to, to not... Uh, there's, there, there isn't really a real liberalism being present here that, well, we don't have any obligation to anyone. As I mentioned, the Bhagavad Purana does, does have a narrative conception of self that we do have obligations to others. We do have relationships because we have feelings of love. We have a love ethic. There are loyalties towards others. But those loyalties towards others are intention, so to say, towards our loyalty towards God. And that depends on our love. That depends upon where our heart is. And a very nice example of this, and this is one of the slides I skipped, um, in, in, you know, uh, it took longer than I'd expected. So that's why I had to end it a little uh, abruptly. Um, the, one of the examples that I give is a Bhishma, right? Bhishma is like the, uh, you could say the Eastern uh, counterpart of, of this, um, uh, of this uh, Robert Lee, right? Or, or the French pilot, where Bhishma knows that the just side are the Pandavas, right? He knows that they are on the right side. Yet he takes a vow. Well, he's taken this vow beforehand. He's taken a vow to always fight on the side of his king, of his nation. Now, when he participates in this battle, he knows that the, the correct side are the Pandavas, yet he still chooses to be loyal to his nation to the kingdom of Hastinapur and fight against the Pandavas. A decision that is very um, controversial to this day. It's very controversial in the text. It's very controversial in contemporary de decisions. But is it okay for Bhishma, who is a very noble soul, who knows what the right thing to do is to fight on the side of the Pandavas and who supports the Pandavas? Is it okay to, for him to fight on the wrong side simply because he feels loyal toward the kingdom that has sustained him or the kingdom that his father was part of, which is Hastinapur. And so this would be an example of someone who, one could say is an example of someone who, who does not make that choice of giving up his sort of worship of his ancestors in place of worship of the good or God. Right? So, so he, he at the end has to sort of be brought down, but because of, of his adherence to the truth, 
still his loyalty is greatly appreciated because of his adherence to his vow. And so he's kind of a, a figure in the Mahabharata that is both very righteous, but also uh, very controversial. Thank you. We have uh, uh, two or three more questions, uh, Gopal, one of which is, could you um, stop sharing your slides so we can oh. see you on full screen okay. when you're okay. speaking? Uh, there is a question from Soham. Should a sinful act performed in obedience to divine command or in mm. order to prove one's loyalty to God be mm. considered a dharma or a redefinition of dharma? Mm. Okay, very nice. Um, so uh, according to, the, to these texts like the Gita and Mahabharata, I mean, a sinful act cannot be an act that is loyal to God. Because God, by definition, is good. So if it's, if it's sinful, it's not good. And so here we have to distinguish between Arjuna, who is standing in front of Krishna. Krishna is directly telling him what to do. He doesn't want to do it. So his heart is full of compassion, but he's doing it only out of duty, out of sort of uh, his loyalty towards doing the right thing, towards dharma, and his loyalty towards um, society and, and the kingdom, that he's, he's fighting, not for himself. We have to differentiate between him and those people who claim that they do things in the name of God, but are actually acting simply out of act, anger or terrorism or hate. So that, that is not, you know, that's not the, the, the spirit. Now, I think there was another part to your question that was very interesting, which was um, uh, uh, that should, should we act out of div divine command, um, out of loyalty to God? I think you were referring to that. Um, and uh, and that's, that's sort of a, a very uh, interesting, you know, broad question that, you know, to, to what degree um, do we balance our duties towards the divine command, so to say, our loyalties towards, um, and that depends on a person's outlook towards God and towards our family and towards our nation and society. Thank you. I, I should say um, Pasha is, uh, is in Australia, right, Pasha? Mm -hmm. um, not in Malaysia. Uh, we have a question. We have Dr. Uh, Raj Balkaran, I think from uh, Toronto, right, mm -hmm. or Canada. Um, and his question is, uh, would you say these two levels of dharma ma uh, map on the nivriti or pravati dharmas to some extent? Mm. Yes. Um, so pravritti and nirvritti, these are more two paths. So the path of pravritti is the path to enlightenment by accepting the things in this world and using them for the right cause. This is called pravritti. Another way to put it is yukta vairagya, or you accept the world, but you accept wealth or money and your family, but you use it um, for a good purpose, for God. Most of us on this call are probably on the pravritti path. The nivritti path is a path that says, well, you go to God by renouncing the world. You, you help the world by renouncing it in some ways. You, you become a mendicant, a monk, and those people are also very effective. Uh, the Buddha, um, Jesus Christ, um, uh, the saints of India, um, they, they are so, uh, you know, they're renunciates and they've taken the path of nivritti, but then they're out helping people, talking to people, elevating their consciousness, giving them knowledge, taking them out of their misery, counseling them. So that's the nivritti path of dharma. So our loyalties can be expressed through either path, which is a very interesting point because, um, uh, a person who gives up material pleasures and acts for the benefit of the world. I mean, almost someone like Mahatma Gandhi, uh, you know, since it's his birthday today, you know, uh, it's, it's good to mention him that, you know, he, he pretty much renounced his possessions, his life, his own happiness as a sacrifice and service for humanity. 
Um, so that was a very extreme form of loyalty towards humanity. The most broadest community that we have is humanity, right? Uh, and so, um, and so that is um, the nivriti path. And others may do so, express their loyalty by engaging what they have in good works. You know, um, you know, donating to the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. That would be, be the pravritti mark. <laughs> That, that brings us quite uh, nicely to um, uh, close on, uh, on a very, very inspiring, beautiful talk, uh, Gopal. So everyone in uh, your usual way, if you could send a reaction to say thank you before I pass it on to Nitin to close. There is one more question from someone. Uh, Dr. Gupta, I love Mo and Maya. Is that sinful? Wow, I love that question because my dissertation and my book was on the concept of Maya. So, so you love Moha and Maya, is that sinful? Um, well, uh, this brings us uh, really back to, uh, uh, to this pravritti and nivritti point that we were mentioning. Because Moha and Maya, not so much Moha, Moha is being bewildered, illusioned. So, I mean, that's kind of uh, something that, that we, uh, even though we might say we love it, we actually probably don't because, because moha is, is not knowing the truth. It's like being, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's being in a bewildered state. But maya, maya is something very nice. It has oftentimes a negative connotation but maya can simply refer to this world and the things of this world, the material things of this world. So if we love the things of this world, that's totally fine, right? That's the pravriti marga. What we do is we uh, want to use the things in this world for a good cause rather than a destructive cause. And that's the proper use of maya. And yes, if we use maya for a good cause, then certainly, Deepakji, you can love maya. And that's what technology is, right? That's what uh, technology can be used to destroy the world. And technology can also be used to help the world and to improve the world. And we're using technology right now to have this wonderful discussion that we're having. So um, moha, uh, maya is more of a neutral term. It refers to the material world, to nature. The material world in of itself is not bad. It can be elusive. It can make us, put us into moha, but it can also be liberating depending on how we use it and how we see it. Thank you so much all. I think we'd like to show our gratitude to Gopal and we, I'm going to pass you on to, to Nitin now to close off this, uh, this talk. So thank you all very much for attending. Nitin, you want to unmute? Thank you, Dr. Gopal. Uh, that was excellent. You did it with um, great humility and uh, passion and uh, talked about something that's very close to all of our hearts and all the dilemmas we face from day to day. Um, and this is an international kind of a group that has come along. And I think that this the, the common area that has brought us all together is the Oxford Center of Hindu Studies. And I was very interested to know earlier on, those who may have missed it, that you tried to be, uh, become an electrical engineer and then end, spent seven years at Oxford, um, sort of migrated towards the Center for Hindu Studies, and now you are a professor in Aurora University. And congratulations and thank you so much for what you have done. And this is exactly what the Oxford Center of Hindu Study does. Um, it's got um, uh, numerous um, uh, scholars. Uh, it's got online courses that are doing that they do. A lot of the uh, subjects are kind of um, not uh, identified with any one sampradaya. It actually gives a very broad academic sense, and it's for you to figure out what you like and enjoy. And it's a range of incredible scholars from all over the world, India, etc. What I wanted to tell the audience is that um, when we arrange these talks, um, the purpose is to ensure that 
not only we, we spread the message of uh, academic studies of Hindu studies at Oxford, but also that it's an organized, it's part of uh, building excellence in, in, in the area. And to do that, it needs to be sustainable. And we ask all of you to talk about it as much as possible, see whether you can actually uh, contribute towards it, see whether you can take part in it, see whether you want uh, your families, children, anybody who doesn't know about the OCHS, please talk about it. It's a huge organization. It's becoming a huge organization, sending scholars to all sorts of universities and demystifying a lot of Hindu thoughts in, in a language that we can understand English, uh, uh, but you may want to do Sanskrit if you want to do that at OCHS as well. So with that, I want to thank you all, but please do not forget the value this uh, brings along. This video is obviously will be available on on uh, on YouTube, um, and uh, we shall let you know about other ones as soon as they arrive. But please tell, please tell your friends, colleagues, etc., to come along. Thank you. Do we, Raj, Pai, would you like to close off? Yes. Thank you, Nitin. Thank you. Would you like to unmute? Uh, sorry, yeah. Can you hear me all right now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Dr. Gopal, fascinating, really absolutely fascinating. You know, a simple lecture, but it'll keep our mind occupied for days to come. Um, so thank you for taking the time and trouble. But while you are here, I'd like to take this opportunity. And um, as Nitin Bai said, how valuable the center is. Well, we keep on saying this and people who actually feel that, uh, yes, I'm contributing, but what does it actually do and who benefits? So from hearing it from your mouth, because I know for a full world that you spent seven years um, studying at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. So if you can give us your personal insight of what our friends funds, how they help the students and the center, that will just envelop it all for us. Thank you. Yes, I would uh, love to. Um, I have such wonderful memories of my time at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. Uh, first of all, it's just a place that, uh, that nurtures, that uh, encourages, and that um, expands the study of, of South Asian Eastern Hindu traditions. It's, um, there's nothing like it in the world. And now I've been in academia a full 10 years, uh, you know, uh, gone, you know, taught at four different universities, uh, you know, you know, visited so many conferences, so many places. And I just want to mention that, you know, after leaving there, there's just no atmosphere um, place that has that level of, of an in-depth and um, supportive and large community of scholars and students that are doing what they're doing and, and, and keeping this tradition alive and preserved. And what it does, especially with this um, name attached to Oxford University, is that it gives people who, 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 are, who are enthusiastic to study this, it gives them a platform by which they can actually share this beautiful wisdom, share this knowledge with the rest of the world. And I found this very much in my own life. I graduated with my PhD uh, from Oxford University, from the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies in 2014. And then after that, uh, you know, I, I uh, taught a year, um, uh, uh, well, actually two years at Florida Gulf Coast University in Florida, then a year at the College of Idaho, then two years at the University of Evansville. And now, at, at in this endowed position at Aurora University. And this present position that I have, it's called the Joe Dunham Distinguished Professorship in Ethics. And when I applied for it, you know, there are over 200 applicants for this position, 200 PhDs from around the world that applied for it. It's a position in ethics, so a general position in ethics. It's not anything specifically in Hinduism or South Asian traditions. 
So very broad. So you can imagine how many people were applying from it, from how many different places, from different uh, perspectives. And uh, frankly speaking, when we study ethics in the Western world, it's all Western ethics. You know, the stuff that I was presenting to you earlier in the presentation, that's what's out there. And when I applied for it, there are so many different directions that the people, the search committee could have taken this position. Right? They could have hired someone in Western ethics, uh, in, in Christian ethics, um, in you know, uh, uh, business ethics, medical ethics, in any different field. Yet some or the other, they chose to hire someone who specializes in Hinduism, Hindu studies, and uh, you know, ethics in our tradition. And why did they make that choice? Well, to this, reason, to this day, I can't understand, but I can understand. The reason is, is because of Oxford University, right? They saw my background of studying at Oxford University and how I brought um, uh, a multicultural, a multidimensional uh, aspect into the study of ethics where now it's no longer just a Western discussion, but the very rich dharma traditions, our traditions of dharma can be imbibed and engulfed in this study. And because the title of Oxford was behind it, they could trust it. They could say, well, this person isn't just going to bring anything in. They're going to bring something very solid, very genuine in. And I think that's what set me apart from the rest of the 200 applicants. And so I owe my you know, wonderful position here to the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. And I know that I would not have made it so far. And the study of our tradition would not have made it so far if it was not for the center. You know, again, at Aurora University, they would have been studying Western ethics, Kantian ethics, uh, you know, uh, all these standard ethics. And this, you know, our tradition would have remained hidden. The tradition of the East, the Dharma traditions would continue to remain hidden. And, and we really need to do this. I mean, we really need to be part of the dialogue. And the Oxford Center of Hindu Studies is making that dialogue possible. I should add a small anecdote here that um, when my brother, as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, someone mentioned that you know, my, my brother is also um, very much involved with the center and he studied there before I did. Um, he was sort of an inspiration behind why I came there. When my brother was out looking for universities to study, uh, Sanskrit and Hinduism, one of the places he applied was at Harvard. And when he met the professor of Harvard there, um, he was so shocked to have my brother as an applicant. And he said, you know, you're the first um, person of Indian origin who's come to study Sanskrit and Hinduism at Harvard, yeah. who's applied to study <laughs> Harvard. And, um, and, uh, uh, and, and at that point, my brother could understand that the reason why Hindu studies is not part of the dialogue is for no other reason other than the fact that we ourselves are not studying our tradition in academics. We ourselves are forgetting to do that. And so what Oxford Center for Hindu Studies is doing, so then finally my brother ended up studying at Oxford. He, he went to the Oxford Center and clearly that was his choice uh, given all the uh, resources and facilities that it provides. It's better than Harvard. <laughs> Even though I'm from America, I can say this. Um, so, so when, uh, so uh, this Oxford Center, it's keeping, it's encouraging this tradition of studying our tradition and, and like, like all the other, um, you know, uh, societies, nations are doing, they're studying their histories, their traditions. We are far behind. And and uh, by, by the work that the Oxford Center is doing, it's raising that awareness that it's so important to study our tradition. It's so important to preserve our manuscripts before they're lost to antiquity. It's so important to not just preserve them, but to talk about them, but to write about them, to translate them, to study them, because that is the best way to preserve a tradition and knowledge. If we stop studying a tradition, we don't preserve it. It stays in a library, it's locked up, it's not relevant. 
And uh, one of the things I enjoy about my own position here in ethics is that it allows me to make these sort of uh, ancient principles or ancient texts relevant to modern discourses and ethics. And that's what Oxford Center is about. It's, it's at the heart of the intellectual discussion. It's making it relevant. So I'll stop here. No, no, thank you. Honestly, that was absolutely fantastic because this is what we are trying to tell people that maybe the Oxford uh, Center for Hindu Studies is not for necessarily for all of us, but there are few between us, right? Who will shine and get the benefit of a center such as this, right? And it is so important because if we can get numerous scholars like yourself coming out, again, you'll uh, helpfully encourage more and more scholars like you to go through that same center. And that's all our aim is. But at the same time, while you benefited in such a glorious way, we are also doing alongside this online courses and smaller bite-sized uh, things for people like myself who really want a little bit out of it, not necessarily become an academic. So for us, it's also been a lifeline, just like you, right? So all in all, the center has something for everyone. Mm. And the message you've given there is absolutely phenomenal. So thank you for taking the time again. And thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you. And I should also mention one thing that more and more I'm finding that my students, they're actually discovering the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies website as as like the go-to point for Hindu for information on Hinduism and Hindu studies, which I'm so pleased by because there's so much misinformation on the internet. And now, you know, in my time when I was studying there 10 years ago, like you mentioned, Oxford Center for Hindu Studies was really for those few who really wanted to study it, right? But, but now I'm finding that actually Oxford Center for Hindu Studies is actually becoming more for the world. Like it's for everyone, scholars, students. They actually like refer to the websites for the courses for the you know the online uh, podcast that you have up there and they'll listen to it and they'll come back and they'll refer to it in a paper they'll refer to it they'll, they'll go to it so i would definitely say that the oxford center is actually a very broad organization that's becoming the resource i mean the, the accepted standard resource for hinduism like it's it's no longer just an oxford thing it's actually a real uh, it's, a, it's a sensation now. It's like people know about Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, a pleasing thought for you to sleep on tonight. Mm -hmm. Basha's name up, came up a couple of times in uh, conversation this evening. He moved from Malaysia to Australia and so on. <laughs> he's actually, he's now actually decided to come and do his master's at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. Wow. What a beautiful thought, right? Thank you. Thank That's you. really encouraging. So you can see that like you said, it's not a localized thing, it's a global thing, right? And this is what it's about, that with the uh, aid of all this technology, you mentioned that in your speech as well, the world has become smaller, but we can connect with people far and wide and there will be people who will benefit immensely. And in hopefully, Kasha, on one condition though, you have to come here and you have to give us one of our, your talks in a few years' time. <laughs> With that in mind, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And please donate whatever you can towards the cause of the Oxford Center through the Friends channel. Thank you for watching and see you again soon at our next talk.